Okay, this is the uh, last lecture of the McGurr section. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you some setup for the film, and then we're going to talk about the conclusion of the book. So, um, the film is Hatred and, Hung uh, Hatred and Hunger. It's part of the uh, uh, Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century series. Um, and in order uh, to situate it into the context of uh, what McGurr has been talking about, we need to know a little bit about um, Woodrow Wilson. So we know that uh, the United States entered the war because of the uh, actions of the Germans. Uh, and in April 1917, the United States entered the war. As we saw, they were uh, ill-prepared. Uh, and so relying upon the progressives to achieve uh, ramping up and um, uh, maximizing the efficient uh, production for the war effort was something progressives did. But it also appealed to things that the progressives cared about. And it, it was part of the rhetoric of um, Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson, a famous speech um, uh, he gave called, laid out what he called his 14 points. And you can actually find that speech under the additional material on Blackboard um, under course material. So. In his speech, he laid out uh, some of the uh, high-minded themes to justify U.S. entry into the war. And so uh, Woodrow Wilson proclaimed that this was a war to uh, save democracy, uh, in which the United States was uh, joining uh, on the Allied side with the, the nations that were democracies against uh, authoritarian regimes of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany. Uh, and so uh, this is... This is not a war, as Woodrow Wilson said, about you know, improving our position in the great game of empires. Uh, it's not about uh, territorial aggrandizement. It's not about acquiring overseas colonies. Um, this is not the reason why the United States is entering this war. It is entering it for, uh, to create a new world order, a new world peace that's going to follow uh, this titanic um, battle. Uh, known as the Great War. So Woodrow Wilson is proposing um, this sort of high-minded rhetoric, and he's giving very concrete ways that this is going to be uh, achieved, this new world order is going to be achieved so that there will be peace uh, as opposed to future conflict, right? And so uh, he has a couple of different things that he proposes uh, as, as guaranteeing this new world will be a peaceful world and a just world. One is that he believes um, nations that can choose their government will not choose governments that take them to war. And so uh, extend, expanding the franchise to uh, people all around the world, speaking especially about nations um, that were colonial possessions, uh, are, as what, are the method that Woodrow Wilson sees as um, helping to forestall future conflict. So uh, spreading democracy is something that Woodrow Wilson uh, believes this war effort is about and believes this is why the United States is entering. He says this should be a war without victors because he believes that um, putting on punishment on the defeated nations will only engender resentment and bitterness that will result in future conflict. And so uh, he says this should be a war in which there are no victors, that instead of a, a punishment, uh, doled out to the victors, to the losers, there should be a, a hand up uh, to, uh, you know, help them recover and, and foster peaceful relations. He believes that a punishment will only engender uh, future violence, right, or future warfare or, or in conflict. He proposes a mechanism uh, to maintain this peace, right, and this mechanism that he is proposing is the creation of a League of Nations, right, in which uh, all nations will come together in a forum uh, where they, instead of resorting to conflict, these nations can uh, hash out um, their differences in a collective uh, body. Uh, and this collective body will um, uh, provide a forum for conflict re resolution and will also, by combined action, ensure a just uh, outcome uh, between these disputes. Um, the idea is that collectively there will be uh, peace maintained by the League, um, imposing um, penalties on nations that seek to, um, you know, break the peace. 
Uh, and so this idea is something that's a key proponent of Woodrow Wilson's um, vision for a post-war world. And this rhetoric is something that he promotes uh, at the outset of the war, during the war, and as we shall see in the film, uh, in this period where now there is a ceasefire uh, and uh, the terms for um, uh, the peace treaty are being uh, discussed. And that's where the film picks up. Uh, so in, this, uh, in the film, you're gonna see the discussions uh, and the plans and vision of Woodrow Wilson. You're going to see the vision of um, uh, Clemenceau, the French uh, prime minister or French president. Uh, and you're going to see the British uh, prime minister uh, all promoting their vision is also a little bit talking about the Italians. And so talking about um, how, what the outcome of this uh, catastrophic war was to be um, is, is part of this uh, uh, conclusion to the conflict in which the vision that Woodrow Wilson has uh, is not necessarily the same vision uh, that his allies have. Uh, and so um, instead, what uh, the piece that is imposed is what the film talks about. And so something to keep in mind watching the film is to think about um, how does this conclusion to the Great War set up the events that uh, lead us into World War II, right? Because that's very clearly uh, what the intent is of the film. So part of the quirk of um, the United States uh, Constitution and policymaking is that uh, the executive branch can negotiate treaties, but treaties have to be ratified by the Senate. So Woodrow Wilson um, didn't achieve um, many of the goals he sought to achieve and that he listed as the 14 points that were the key, he believed, for uh, a just peace, uh, and a just peace that would be a lasting peace. So, uh, he did manage to get the League of Nations. And so when he came back to the United States, Woodrow Wilson sailed over for these negotiations over in Europe, uh, uh, in Paris, negotiating these, um, these determinations of how peace was going to be imposed and what would be the terms for the defeated uh, nations to sign. He came back to the United States that had um, elected members into the Senate who were um, opposed to continual uh, U.S. intervention in European affairs uh, and uh, were deeply opposed to the notions that the prerogatives of the United States would be turned over to this international body, the League of Nations. So Woodrow Wilson faced opposition in the Senate and, and under the Constitution, um, he has to have a two-thirds vote for, in the Senate to ratify treaties, right? So he's facing an uphill battle because there's strong resistance uh, in the Senate. So Woodrow Wilson decides he's going to um, uh, get the support of the Senate in the, way, in the way he had generated political power throughout his time as presidency. He's going to go directly to the people. So he went on uh, a train-led uh, um, or train-traveling uh, speaking tour, uh, speaking directly to the public, to explain to them what the League of Nations was designed to do, to generate support for the United States uh, in the League of Nations, and to put pressure on senators uh, to um, ratify uh, this uh, peace treaty that he had brought back uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. This effort um, uh, broke uh, Woodrow Wilson. Wil Woodrow Wilson was uh, physically uh, exhausted uh, from his time in the White House. Uh, from the arduous um, negotiations with the allies overseas. And uh, it appears Woodrow Wilson had contracted Spanish flu uh, while he was over in Europe. Uh, he was laid up for a, a couple of weeks and could not engage uh, in these discussions. And so he was physically uh, and um, I would say mentally exhausted by these efforts. Uh, and so he gave a speech, a rousing speech, well-received in Colorado, and he got on his train for an overnight trip uh, to give another speech in Kansas, where he was going to be rallying people's support, and he had a stroke uh, on the train. So he was whisked back uh, directly to Washington, D.C., uh, where he was incapacitated for several months. There's a 
uh, sort of a joke uh, that says we had our first woman president uh, because Woodrow Wilson was in his uh, sick bed uh, and um, he nobody was allowed to visit him except um, his physician and his um, uh, young wife. And his young wife was said she was the only one that can understand what uh, Woodrow was saying. And so she transmitted uh, the wishes, she said, of Woodrow to the cabinet who were waiting outside in the antechamber. And so for several months, while this uh, debate about what the United States was, gonna go, uh, was going to do, Woodrow Wilson was largely incapacitated. Uh, the vote came to the Senate and the Senate did not ratify the treaty obligation. So uh, a bitter uh, and uh, still sick um, Woodrow Wilson uh, had his uh, involvement in the United States uh, in this League of Nations denied by, uh, by his own United States Senate. These issues about how the nation should continue, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, even if he was physically able to run again, uh, would not be running again in the 1920 election. And so these issues are put uh, again uh, before the American public. This is another uh, watershed election in which uh, two stark visions are put before um, the American public. And one side, uh, there is the Democratic candidate who's running on uh, this continued U.S. involvement in overseas events, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, and the progressive um, uh, reforms that were ongoing in business and, uh, and social and cultural life in the United States. On the other side, you had uh, the Republican, a man by the name of Warren G. Harding, who is near as I can tell his greatest claim uh, to uh, fame as president is that he coined a new term. His term was normalcy, and he ran on a slogan of a return to normalcy. So what normalcy meant for Warren G. Harding and what it meant for the Republican Party and what it was expressed to the American people was that we don't need any more of this uh, progressive interference in everyday life. We don't need progressive interference in your personal life. We don't need progressive uh, interference uh, in a uh, diplomatic world. Uh, and we don't need progressive interference in business. All these things were abnormal, according to Warren G. Harding. And so what he said was, we need to reject this progressive uh, uh, meddling in all sorts of ways and tend to our own knitting here in the United States. Let's focus on the United States and our um, interests and concerns. And we do, we should not uh, continue to be involved in these progressive goals. So there are two different visions, again, put before the American public. And the American public votes overwhelmingly for Warren G. Harding, right? And so this vision of uh, laissez-faire capitalism, uh, this vision of uh, non-governmental um, interference uh, in the way people live, uh, this uh, rejection and uh, resistant to being involved in events overseas, particularly uh, in Europe, uh, was um, strongly supported by the American public in this election. And uh, Warren G. Harding was good on his word. That's exactly what he provided this uh, uh, ratcheting back of governmental regulation and intervention, uh, largely allowing companies to continue to operate as they see fit, uh, self-regulating. Uh, and this enters a period, a very deep period of something that um, has been part of American life for a very long time up until this point, uh, and that's isolationism. So the United States consciously rejected a role in international affairs, um, and not just Warren G. Harding. Harding died of a heart attack um, uh, in the arms of his mistress, apparently, where his vice president, uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, took over the presidency and then won his own term. Uh, only uh, Calvin Coolidge decided not to run again. He was, a, uh, he was referred to as a very taciturn man. Uh, so um, he uh, made his announcement that he would not be seeking uh, re-election by writing on a scrap of paper, uh, I choose not to run again, uh, and uh, passing it to a reporter and said, here, show this to everybody else. So uh, Coolidge um, uh, did, not, uh, did not seek re-election uh, after his, uh, serving his term, and so uh, Herbert Hoover uh, was elected. We'll have much to say about Herbert 
Herbert Hoover uh, when we get into uh, the New Deal. Uh, but he uh, wins the presidency in 1928. Um, this uh, Republican uh, uh, string of uh, presidential elections um, marked uh, a, a rejection of what the progressives were uh, uh, doing and envisioned a very limited uh, view of what the federal government should be doing. So uh, they gutted economic reforms. There was this return to individualism and laissez-faire, both in the public world and as in, you know, in the private world, people um, uh, rejected these reforming notions that the progressives had uh, been relentlessly promoting. This was a period of uh, prohibition. Uh, so there were um, things going on. This is referred to as the Roaring Twenties. Uh, the economy was booming during this time sort of, as we shall see, uh, as we go into our next section. Uh, this is also the time that there's a very public embrace of this pursuit of pleasure, um, nicely embodied by the speakeasy, the uh, illegal uh, prohibition bar uh, where things uh, were going on behind closed doors, unregulated and uh, unseen because the doors were closed. Okay, so here we have, that's the, uh, the progressive era. Uh, there was nobody who was a progressive uh, officially in 1900. Um, by 1912, four candidates running for the presidency. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, ran as a progressive. Uh, Eugene Debs, um, running as a socialist, ran as a progressive. Um, William Howard Taft, running for re-election as, as a Republican, ran as a progressive. And Teddy Roosevelt founded a new party called the New Progressive Party. Uh, or the Progressive Party, which uh, had as its slogan, uh, the bull moose from Teddy's, one of Teddy's famous speeches, where he said, um, someone asked him how he felt, and he said, I feel as strong as a bull moose. So uh, from nobody being a progressive in 1900, you have everybody wanting to be a progressive in 1912. Uh, by 1918, at the height of the war, the U.S. involvement in the war effort overseas and at home, uh, the progressives reached the greatest impact they had. Uh, and then in the 1920 election, they are firmly rejected by the American public and the progressives as a movement, as a reform group that had uh, impact, largely disappeared. Although as we shall see, much in the way that the progressives were a continuation in some measure of what the populists had sought to achieve, uh, progressive ideas would be reborn uh, in the New Deal. Okay. That's it for McGurr, and that's it for our second section, uh, and we uh, will soon have a test.